Hi, uh, my name is Luke Meekin, uh, and I'm here with Oscar Keys, or not really with Oscar Keys, but virtually with him and with you uh, in this video presentation. Uh, we're here to share um, our work uh, in critically crafting digital places, making immersive, sensorily rich 3D worlds um, with middle school students and thinking critically about um, what does it mean to make a digital place and what does uh, what does a digital place do to the, to, to the world and to our bodies as we make them? Um, what are the responsibilities that come with making a place, whether it's a digital place or a, or a physical place. Um, we created a free online resource for teaching this stuff that uses all free tools, including tools that are um, amenable to, to teaching remotely, if that's how you're teaching. Um, the link to that is in the upper left of the screen. Um, uh, the way our talk is going to work is I, I'm going to share first um, my kind of framing of, of the teaching and learning and making that we've been doing uh, through the lens of my own dissertation research uh, at my doctoral program. Uh, so my, my part of the talk is going to be a little bit um, th theory heavy, a little bit academic. Um, Oscar's going to share his experience uh, of the, the, the camp as well through his own theoretical lens. Uh, and then at the end, we're actually going to just take a walk through some of the student works and reflect on what we notice and, and see and feel as we're going through them. So uh, if you uh, are interested in the kind of nitty gritty theory academic stuff, um, awesome. Please join us through this whole video. Um, if you're mainly interested in, you know, I want to I want to know how to teach this and I want to see the kind of cool stuff that the students made, um, definitely check out our resource. Definitely check out the video at the end. And honest, honestly, I, I, I invite you to, to watch the whole video. But, um, you know, I want to respect where you're coming from and I want to respect your time and, and, and the, the, you know, the, the reasons that you come to NAEA for, the things that excite you and the things that inform what happens in your classroom. So we're trying to, to, to bring stuff for everybody here. Um, and yeah, yeah, feel free to, to take it all in or pick and choose as, as what suits you, right? Um, that's one of the wonders of, of doing this virtual, virtual conference. Um, so I'm going to start us off by talking about my dissertation work. Um, I'm calling it uh, Critically Crafting Digital Places, Cultivating Critical Sensitivities to Unsettle Settler Sentiments of Digital Place. Um, my present inquiry looks at the potentials that critical perspectives on digital placemaking practices may hold for art teaching with digital materials. I'm critically examining my own placemaking, um, partially through my co-crafting of a digital curricular website, the, the resource linked there. Um, uh, alongside with Oscar. Uh, and then I'm also um, examining my co-crafting of the, the digital curricular place of learning that I built together with Oscar and with the youth um, in this synchronous, digitally mediated remote learning summer camp that we were all in together this summer. Um, the lens through which I'm looking at this uh, is informed by digital materialisms and critical place and land studies. I'll unpack those later. Uh, and I'm using an action research methodology with the aim of iteratively transforming uh, my own teaching, um, but also transforming the, the pedagogic agency of the, of the Crafting Digital Places website as well. Um, my main research question guiding all of this is how might critical sensitivity to the material qualities of digital places inform the recrafting of a curriculum as a place of learning? Uh, so one of the sub-questions of that is, how does conceiving a digital curricular website as a place of learning, um, which means an agentic, nonlinear context inviting varied traversals and comprising material qualities that enact ideologies, um, how does that inform the ongoing recrafting of that website uh, and the, the enacted curriculum, right, the, the place in which that site participates, the, the camp itself? Uh, I'm also wondering, how might critically crafting this curriculum as a place of learning, materially invite students' development of their own critical sensitivities to the material qualities of digital places, particularly to the ways these qualities enact or resist settler colonial ideologies of place. I want to define some key terms from those research questions because I kind of threw a lot out there. Um, here, the material qualities of place are the invitations and inhibitions toward action and sensation um, evinced by a place. Um, in this, this study, right, materiality is not the same as physicality, right? Materiality is performative. Materiality is a product of the ways materials act on bodies, which means digital places can just as readily possess material qualities as physical places do. Um, I'm also looking at 
uh, this, this concept of critical sensitivity, um, which is an awareness of the material qualities evinced by material entities, things, uh, the ways those material qualities act on bodies, uh, and the ideologies they enact. Because digital places may materially enact an ideology imbued intentionally or not by a human designer, necessitating deliberate modes of sensitizing inquiry. Um, critical sensitivity here complements a more common concept of critical literacy you might have heard of, um, which is focused on vi in, in visual culture art ed. Um, and critical literacy articulates cultural artifacts as texts demanding critical readings of their meanings. Um, instead, critical sensitivity frames digital artifacts as materials uh, demanding critical awareness of their doing. So we're not looking at, you know, unpacking meaning here. We're looking at figuring out what is this doing to me? What is this doing to society? Uh, so the conception of curriculum in this study is as a place of learning, um, which frames curricula as places comprising material qualities and curriculum development as a form of placemaking. Uh, this draws on uh, scholar Elizabeth Ellsworth's conception of places of learning, wherein a curriculum is not a scaffold of objectives or cognitive schemas, nor a series of concepts to address, but a place featuring material invitations that can habituate sensory, bodily, and active relations to place. For Ellsworth, places of learning foster connections between bodies, foster sensory experiences for sensing bodies, and in doing so, places teach bodies things. Decolonial scholars Mark Rifkin, Nitsu Kana, Injong Yoon Ramirez, and Benjamin Ramirez have explored ways that material qualities of colonized places enact their own sensory curriculum, habituating bodies with sentiments such as settler entitlement to land and place. Uh, until recently, my own art education teaching with digital materials um, was settled within the visual culture paradigm, which, like I said, largely deploys a literacy metaphor where students critically engage with the visual culture artifacts as texts. Uh, in this project, um, I wanted to explore the potentials beyond visual culture's semantic focus for art education with digital materials. Um, to do so, I, I investigated how critical sensitivity to the material agency of the digital might inform the creation of curriculum as a digital place of learning. Uh, in doing so, I wanted to bring attention to the neglected materiality of digital processes, artifacts, and places. The conception of digital, uh, digital media as being immaterial fosters art educator antipathy toward digital materials, uh, and it omits the political, environmental, and economic realities entailed in teaching with digital materials. Um, the material agency exerted by digital places often reifies white settler colonial attitudes toward place. For example, libertarian norms in digital archival places, Cartesian spatial systems in game design environments, and cartographic conventions in digital maps all, in different ways, uh, obviate indigenous place relations. Uh, digital places also often assert themselves as white property through their material qualities. Social media and search sites often frame non-white bodies through racist lenses rooted in data collected from white users. And 3D game places often exclude bodies of color to deploy them as sources of identity tourism uh, for presumed white users. Uh, in my study, I'm turning uh, my attention to the Crafting Digital Places site that Oscar and I have built together. Um, we, we've developed it in camp programs over the last three summers, uh, and I'm specifically examining the outcomes of the most recent revisions to the site that were made with attention to the ways digital places materially perform ideologies. So my theoretical frame for this study uh, weaves together three threads. Um, the first thread uh, concerns digital materialisms, encompassing both the performed materiality of digital materials and the socio-material entanglements of their use. Um, the first of these two digital materialisms focuses on the micro-political agentic doings of digital things within complex relational contexts, uh, and it's kind of rooted in new materialist thought, looking at how objects interact with each other, um, sometimes completely outside of human interaction. Right? 
Uh, the second digital materialism uh, focuses on macro political ways that digital systems participate in historic and present power relations with material consequences for laborers and the environment. Um, this type of materialism is more indebted to um, a historical materialism with neo-Marxist antecedents. Um, as such, um, these two strains uh, feel a lot of times for me politically and ontologically at odds uh, with each other, this new materialist and kind of Marxist materialist framing. However, several materialist scholars have articulated how macro and micro political materialisms might operate in concert rather than intention, attending to the continuity between these two registers. Uh, in particular, decolonial scholar Nitu Kana's notion of the visceral highlights a way that the sensing body may act as a hinge point, joining macro and micro political material concerns. Kana's conception of the visceral attends to the materiality of the colonized body, observing how bodies, both colonizer and colonized, accrue habits of sensing and doing within socio-material contexts impacted by varied forms of colonization. Furthermore, for Kana, understanding the visceral dimensions of colonialism is essential to combating contemporary colonizing and anti-democratic political movements that resist textual criticism, argument, and rhetoric, and persist through embodied habit and sentiment. Art educators Yun Ramirez and Ramirez, drawing on Kana's work, argued further that arts experiences and art education pedagogy that frames and facilitates them might interrupt, disrupt, or even change habituated settler sentiments toward place, accomplishing tangible anti-colonial work. Um, however, I'm not trying to mischaracterize the work that we're doing as literally decolonizing, uh, which would mean repatriating stolen land, right? Um, I recognize the assertion of Kei Wayne Yang and Unangach scholar Yves Tuck um, that decolonization is not a metaphor, right? We can work towards decolonization and, and advance anti-colonial concepts in our pedagogy, um, but if we're not giving land back, uh, I'm not going to pat myself on the back for decolonizing art education or digital materials. Um, the second sort of big thread, um, apart from digital materialism, uh, develops a conception of digital place. I'm drawing on Doreen Massey's sense of relational place and the way it's invoked in discussions of place in digital and mediated contexts. Um, and this kind of resists the focus on the geographically proximal present in a lot of place-based scholarship and creates potential for placemaking in networked and digital settings. Um, as discussed earlier, the material qualities of digital places allow them to function as places of learning that embody my inquiry's conception of curriculum. Um, as places of learning, digital places teach bodies things by habituating sensations and actions through their invitations and inhibitions. Uh, Digital places teach bodies things. Uh, within art education, scholars Lynn Budert and Marissa McClure articulated a conception of curriculum and curricular design that likewise conceives of curriculum in terms of place and curriculum development as an architectural placemaking endeavor. However, the resulting curriculum is not an inert edifice, but it's an agentic context that transforms over time through co-participation of students and teachers. Uh, in these curricula as places, teachers might anticipate experiences, but not determine them. Uh, Budert and McClure's curricular approach is rooted in the architectural concept of wayfinding, uh, and curriculum design for them involves the anticipation and documentation of learning framed as experiences in in and journeys through curriculum as place. Uh, as discussed earlier, colonized places may habituate colonizing place norms. Uh, digital places are just as able to materially impart colonizing curricula of place. Uh, and in turn, digital places of learning might unsettle embodied settler colonial place norms. Um, the third major, major thread of my theoretical framework um, problematizes white settler placemaking practices uh, and attends to decolonizing and indigenous conceptions of place and land. This includes sensitivity toward histories of digital and physical place that frustrate settler entitlement and myths of terra nullius. Uh, indigenous futurity in digital places is manifested through digital archival practices that prioritize indigenous data sovereignty over open data norms. And in the work of indigenous artists who use digital tools to fabulate uncolonized and decolonized place futures. 
Critical attention to qualities of place and land can also defamiliarize settler place norms in physical and digital places. For example, becoming sensitized to settler naming conventions on digital maps, or to the normalization of clearing, claiming, and conquering place relations in commercial video games. Um, I'm pulling together these three threads to articulate a conception of what I'm calling critical sensitivity, um, central to, to my research. Um, critical sensitivity intersects the materialist concerns and the decolonizing concerns of several scholars, all of whom discuss an insensible register at which the material status quo operates, um, necessitating a sensitizing and defamiliarizing mode of critical inquiry. Um, Latour and Ahmed called this register the background. Rifkin called it settler common sense, uh, and Kana called it the unrecognized. Critical sensitivity acknowledges that attending to sensory experiences of sensing bodies in digital places is necessary for critically recognizing and responding to the material qualities of those places. It also recognizes the post-phenomenological assertion that what is sensed is itself a political issue, that habits of sensing are culturally habituated, and that pedagogy can play a part in determining whether colonial histories and realities of place are noticed and unsettled or are relegated to the background. And I'm going to talk about some of the things that we learned in this uh, in this experience teaching through this frame. Um, so having completed this summer's teaching and data collection, uh, I'm in the process of analyzing the data we encountered in, in our teaching with the, with the students. Um, in terms of big picture preliminary findings in teaching this camp, um, I observed a really clear difference in the work students produced this summer versus previous summers. Um, this summer, they were developing places that embodied and explored a variety of power relations to places and their histories. You'll see this when we walk through them at the end of this video. Um, in previous years, um, before I had really addressed this kind of this colonial implications of placemaking, um, students' places kind of focused on the creation of sensory experiences in the present. You know, can I make um, an interesting, a scary haunted place or um, a, a, a fun place with, with sort of uh, amusement park uh, accoutrement or things like that. Um, conversely, this year, with these new invitations and, and provocations uh, in our shared digital places of learning, including that website resource, um, students more intentionally created places that resisted colonizing place norms present in commercial games. Uh, and they also created places which uh, consciously materialized diegetic histories of power and place. Uh, many uh, of the youth explicitly explored issues of power, such as the students who built a city with a thriving community founded by climate refugees adjacent to a wasteland inhabited by the spirits of those not offered refuge. Um, other students were more avoidant in responding to the, the prompts, such as the group who created an emotional dreamscape so that their world would be free from colonial violence, but wouldn't require them to engage with it as a phenomenon. Another theme, as I look back on our teaching, has been my reflecting on the shift from previous years' kind of activist focus on affording students access to digital tools to, to this year's activist focus on putting challenging critical questions between students and those same creative tools. Um, a number of scholars of education with digital materials have critiqued the, having a sole focus on access to technology, um, critiquing that focus as alighting critical qualitative questions about student technology use, uh, and as participating in a kind of neoliberal narrative where individual agency is conferred on students by giving them access to the proverbial master's tools, you know, teaching kids to code so they can be the next Mark Zuckerberg. Um, I'm reflecting on how future iterations of this, this um, website um, might meaningfully deploy both smoothness, access, uh, and use useful friction, right, in tension with each other so that we can maybe achieve the critical and equitable objectives of both of these aims while mitigating the potential hazards of either of them. Another prevalent observation um, Oscar and I both talked about a lot was the students' enthusiasm uh, for engaging in anti-colonial critique of popular commercial digital places such as video games. Um, entering the camp, 
I had some anxiety around youth resistance to discussing colonizing place norms and cherished games, or to engaging in potentially guilt-inducing consciousness raising in a presumably fun summer camp about making game-like projects. Uh, I was surprised to find how readily students engaged in our opening day discussions, and how excitedly they shared examples from their own digital place experiences that they realized mapped onto the models of settler colonialism and exploitation colonialism we had discussed in class as a group. Unresolved questions I'm still reflecting on include whether this student readiness and ease of sharing uh, means that the new provocations we put in the curriculum maybe weren't sufficiently challenging to their norms. Um, but I'm also reflecting, kind of in the other way, on the significance of one participant group that seemed to have much more difficulty engaging with the critical content of the sessions. Um, are there other sensitizing material invitations that could have been present in our teaching to scaffold those students' engagement? Or did the distinctive choices in how those students co-shaped our communal place of learning that week, um, largely all having their mics and cameras off as a group, um, change the material qualities of our place of learning, our Zoom room, uh, in ways that impacted our ability to have critical discourse. Uh, so these are the um, concepts and ideas I'm kind of wrestling with and thinking about uh, uh, as, as we were teaching this and as I reflect on the teaching of this. Um, now I'm going to hand things over to Oscar um, to talk a bit less about um, kind of um, the, the colonial implications of placemaking and more about the ways that um, our, our camp uh, attempted to, to foster a sense of community and presence, um, despite the fact that we were all remote this summer as we were making our places together. So uh, take it away, Oscar. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Oscar Keyes, and I had the absolute pleasure of getting to collaborate with Luke uh, throughout the process of this curricular resource being built um, and the various iterations that we've gone through. Um, and while he's done all this beautiful work uh, to approach the themes of colonialism uh, through the curricular resource, one of the things that I've been really interested in as a researcher is how we build and foster community in our online places. Um, and so what I'm gonna be doing is sort of a, a, a look at what we were able to build during our time in the camp sessions together. So uh, just a tiny overview of what my section is going to be. I'm going to give a very brief theoretical framing and a few examples of the ways that online artists communities um, have created spaces, uh, and specifically through digital art making techniques. Um, and then a look at how this manifested in our specific program. Just to give a little bit of positionality and background uh, with my personal experience with online art making communities, uh, I Myself uh, was a queer trans kid from the rural South on the early web. Uh, and I was also a middle-class kid, a uh, white kid specifically with access to a personal computer in the early 2000s. Uh, so this was a way for me to have uh, the privilege of accessing a safe place for myself online to explore my identity um, and to build community through making media and digital art objects with others. Uh, specifically, I was really involved in early fandom communities as a teenager, where I would download and edit, uh, you know, fan vids of my favorite um, my favorite TV shows. Um, and this is where I gained an interest in media arts, as there weren't none of that was available to me at my school. Um, and so it was this alternative space of learning that really opened up for me and forums were this digital place of community and art making that I really frequented. So uh, this is just like a tiny photo of me with the camera early on uh, with the TV behind it. Uh, but I like to give this kind of framing to sort of understand how I am coming into and facilitating in an online place and what it did for me as a young person specifically. And to really help me understand, I'm going to talk a little bit about Legacy Russell's uh, Glitch Feminism uh, Manifesto. Um, Legacy Russell is a curator, an artist who specifically looks at the way that online life affects the real world. Um, and Glitch Feminism is uh, sort of her like pinnacle text right now. Uh, she finally released this after years and years of research. Um, and it's a collection of a life lived online. So it includes personal narrative, her personal experiences with uh, gender transgressions online and exploring herself and making art with others online and thinking about that through specifically a lens of like race, queerness and feminism. And she looks specifically at other artists whose online lives and personas and engagement transformed their physical material worlds. And she 
makes the case that there is no difference between offline and online. There is no meeting in the IRL. Instead, she offers this way of thinking about life live IRL, which is all the time, whether it's on or offline and away from keyboard, which is specifically referring to when we leave uh, those digital places. However, what we do in the digital place affects our physical place as well. And she really does a beautiful job looking specifically at the ways that queer, trans, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color have transgressed these boundaries historically, as long as the web has been here. Um, so anyway, so her work really situated me understanding my own experience, and then also thinking about the ways um, that this manifests across any of my virtual programs. Another community I wanted to talk about um, that has been really important to my historical work is gli.tc slash h, uh, Glitch. Um, this was a community of glitch artists uh, founded in the 20 teens um, by Nick Briz, Evan Meany, Rosa Minkman, and John Satrom. Uh, for those of you who don't know, glitch art is a digital method of corrupting various codecs, files, formats on a computer uh, to create these artifacts um, that can become textural, different experiences. Uh, they take the unexpected horror <laughs> sometimes of a glitch or a malfunction uh, and make uh, art uh, with it. Glitch was a five-day annual event organized by um, these glitch artists and in it they would share techniques. So it was really interesting because it's this digital art form done by digital artists on their computers and they're coming together to make uh, community. Um, and so I find this to be a really interesting example, sort of in the history of digital art making, to think about community building as a space where we are building out techniques and making more glitch artists through teaching. Um, and so very often what you'll find in these early digital art movements are lots of sharing of techniques, lots of collaboration, uh, and lots of open access and resources. Um, they want to spread <laughs> um, their techniques and knowledge, uh, as opposed to a lot of tech industry, which is very insular. You're trying to protect patents, this types of things. Digital artists have historically shared their methods um, and, and, and tried to build community this way. An example that takes place completely online um, that I think is pretty significant uh, was the 3D Additivist Cookbook uh, project. Um, this was curated and edited by the artists Morishan Aliyari and Daniel Rourke, um, and they collaborated with over 100 different artists who are working in 3D sculpture, animation, specifically folks who are thinking about 3D printing in really unique ways, Additivist uh, being the layer by layer elements coming together. They host this entire resource, which is part, uh, part critical reflections, part recipes for disaster, uh, all the files, formats are released through Creative Commons. Um, and they are releasing all of this online as a form of teaching, as a form of sharing, as a way of building community. Uh, they had lots of online events over the course of both figuring out who wanted to be taking part and also as it came together. It was collaboratively edited. There were open sessions where people would come together and give live feedback, sometimes also in the form of a performance. Um, and the resource itself is released, released through the Creative Commons. Um, and it includes all kinds of materials um, to get started. So once again, this digital art form, very often locked behind really difficult to use software and various things, and artists figuring out their ways through those tools, through non-industry methods, to share with other artists who might not have had the chance to access or experience them. And this whole thing is taking place through online international collaboration. I also would like to mention Dark Study, um, which was founded by the artists Caitlin Cherry, Nicole Wanhee Malouf, and Nora Khan. Uh, this took place during COVID, um, at the start of COVID. It was meant as an alternative place of learning online uh, outside of the higher education institution. Uh, it's considered one of the radical alternatives uh, to the art school studio place. And it was specifically designed to serve underrepresented communities in the arts. Uh, they describe themselves as digitally rooted and virtual first, and they're thinking specifically about the radical potential of teaching online um, as a way for artists who might be in under-resourced areas being able to access really quality studio education through their peers. Um, they are also thinking about the ways that online teaching and learning specifically requires collaboration. Um, and Nora Khan has some really beautiful language on the website, which I recommend checking out, where she really 
synthesizes the beautiful ways that online uh, is sort of a, it's, it was a very equalizing moment between teacher and student because we all had to learn together and the radical potential of that moment of being very vulnerable in an online place together. Um, and then in, as far as like historical um, examples of online digital making um, that I thought were really relevant, um, I wanted to make sure that I mentioned uh, the Do It home version edition that came out in 2002. Do It was a series of artist recipes, uh, sort of in that style of uh, scores and performance scripts. Um, this piece was curated by Hans Ulrich Obrist, and he started collecting these recipes in 1993 um, when Eflux approached him in 2002 to make it available online. And in doing so, they also made an upload download feature. And so other artists could upload their own recipes and instructional art forms for folks to do at home. Um, it was described as autonomous, which we might use as asynchronous now. And it shows that there's an existing set of artist instructions that could be downloaded and shared. And also you yourself could upload your own set of instructions. Um, it was self-described as an informal community of people interested in these subjects, uh, specifically instructional art and other experimental forms of exhibition where you had participatory audience. Uh, and so in this case, the audience is online, you download the instructions and you perform the piece yourself. And in this way, you're all making art together through the same methods. Um, I think this is a really powerful example of sort of the work that uh, Luke and I are trying to do with thinking about the site itself as being a place, a place of digital art making um, that as an asynchronous object, it enables folks to explore and to play with the various materials that we've created. And also it finds itself in a long-standing tradition of artists teaching other artists by sharing their resources, by giving really creative and thoughtful prompts. Um, and I, I think all of this is really helpful for sort of understanding how there's a long-standing tradition pre-COVID of artists making things online together uh, and building community through it and through that sharing. So Thinking about how all of this applies to our specific project, um, I want to talk specifically about how shifting online created more collaboration in our case. Uh, specifically, we had previously been using software called Unity. Unity is a real-time engine. It's a standard across the gaming industry. It is free, or there's a free version of it, I should say. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things that we did when we were in person, every student was working on their own individual projects and they were on their own computer and sort of siloed into their piece. What happened when we moved over to Play Canvas was suddenly we had the ability to share a digital place in the software together. So if you can't quite visualize that, what that really means is that it was like a Google Docs <laughs> uh, opportunity for making in a real-time game engine. For reference, neither Unity nor Unreal Engine are able to do this sort of simultaneous editing. It's only made possible through the use of the web browser. And this was super unexpected for both Luke and I. We were planning to have it, each student just work and play Canvas together. And so one, it was a combination of figuring out that the software could support this collaboration. And then the second was just sort of a happenstance where we found out instead of five days, we had three days <laughs> to do this. And so the only way to get the sort of uh, level of work that we were hoping with the students and level of engagement was to have them work together to make a bigger place together. Um, and so in that first session, uh, Play Canvas was sort of this unexpected alternative for really opening up the collaborative online community making and all these like virtual interactions that we weren't expecting. Um, we did also learn, uh, especially in that first summer of 2020, that online facilitation required so much more intentional community building strategies. Uh, Luke and I were very fortunate to be able to co-teach together. So that way, if a student needed one-on-one -on -one help, we could sort of trade off. Um, we also just noted that we had to come in really prepared with flexibility and adapt, being able to adapt really quickly. And one of the other things too, was that we were collaborating a lot more directly with students. I don't think there's ever been a time where I've been more involved in sort of collaboratively making things with students than I was uh, with the transition to online. And those teaching student designations really start to fall apart. I think especially in early COVID, we could really see the potential of like learning from one another and learning together as we move forward and being able to change and you know, take a different direction uh, based on what students' feedbacks were or what they were discovering or uncovering. 
And I think ultimately I'm a better teacher. <laughs> and I don't know if Luke feels the same, but I know that I do that like this shift to online made me a lot more thoughtful about what it means to facilitate. I can't take things for granted, like being able to be in the same physical place with someone, but creating a sense of place together and that we're all um, involved in that, that making <laughs> of the, the place together. So, and just sort of reflecting on what did we learn? Um, these are some screenshots that Luke kindly shared um, from our teacher reflections that we would do sort of after the sessions as part of his research. Um, as I said, you know, I'm really grateful uh, for the opportunity to have even been able to participate in this project with Luke. Um, but I definitely think we learned that collaborative online projects were not only possible, but also could positively impact students, especially during the early pandemic phase of, um, of the COVID-19. And I think as Nora Khan kind of positioned the possibilities of collaboration online, we really experienced that in our in our place together. We saw students sharing techniques with other groups when they were in the big main group together. One student would ask a question and another student could answer it. Another student might have a problem and another student would have already figured something out. Um, I think something about all being on the same physical, like not the same physical, something about being on the same plane <laughs> Uh, physically on the screen created a better sense of being equal. And what I mean by that is if you think about the traditional structure of a classroom, when you're suddenly all in a little Zoom grid together, there's not as clear of a distinction between who's in charge here. Um, and I think it was really helpful. Even if we were talking to a void of gray screens, there was a sense that we were kind of all in the same place together um, and able to share. Um, and then the final piece uh, is really that intentionality. I think this really prompted, in a lot of ways, Luke particularly to think about what prompts we were bringing to the students, that as we were reducing sort of the friction of making it easier to access the software and different things, what are the ways that we can facilitate discussion? And I think what Luke was really able to do was find really meaningful ways to have students talk to each other and to engage and to create that sense of place uh, in, in Zoom, um, not just the crafting the digital places in their 3D spaces, but also what it meant to craft a place together um, in Zoom um, and experience that online together. And so what we're going to do in this final section is actually show some of the digital places that students crafted. Um, and we'll be sharing sort of our reflections through our particular lenses of colonialism and virtual community building. And we hope you enjoy. So this is the place uh, co-created by a student I'll call Hamilton and two of his group mates in the, the first session of our, our camp. Uh, and unlike uh, a lot of the students, other projects that we'll take a look at, um, rather than uh, creating like a, a, a detailed diegetic colonial history of place, uh, Hamilton and his group mates created a, a metaphorical place. They, they kind of responded to the prompt of not making a colonizing setting um, by avoiding the issue altogether and creating a, a place that served as a metaphor that existed in a dream, um, a series of um, islands, uh, dreamscapes that each reflect uh, a different emotional state. Um, this islands that I'm walking around right now is uh, intended to reflect the, the feeling of joy. Um, and in order to um, express joy in the form of a place, um, Hamilton kind of created this um, sort of assemblage of different examples of um, types of places that are designed or built for joy um, to look at it through kind of a, a colonizing perspective and maybe maybe a way that um, uh, unintentionally colonial histories were still brought into this work, right? All of um, Hamilton's examples of joyful places, right, are examples of ways that um, developed, developed place, colonized place, um, it's kind of built up to extract joy from it as a resource, right? So there's uh, the beach resort, there's uh, a park, and there's a playground. Um, in addition to uh, Hamilton's sort of place of joy, there are two other places here 
um, connected by this central hub of a, of a bed that I'm sort of looking at right now um, to reflect the fact that this is a dream. Um, and from the bed, you can go to this place of joy or you can go to um, a place uh, over there that's meant to represent loneliness. It has a, an overcast dark cloud that's a little hard to see against the black background. Uh, and a place that's uh, meant to represent anger, that's kind of an, an expressionistic reflection of a, of a thunderstorm. And one of the things that, as we were watching these this group work together in particular, um, was just sort of the, uh, the way that their places were all separate from one another, but tethered together. Um, a lot of other groups had to navigate boundary crossing and boundaries coming together. And in this case, it was just really um, interesting that to do this sort of more emotional work, there was almost a desire to put distance um, and to not have that that overlap, but rather allowing them to, to visit one another. Um, and so it was interesting that even in this like collaborative community space, this group in order to explore these more uh, emotional ideas um, and experiences, there's, there's physical distance <laughs> that's being enacted um, in the creation of the place here. Uh, and it just really stood out amongst the other um, communities that we saw forming in the different groups. So unlike the, the previous place that was more metaphorical, uh, th these students who developed this place uh, developed a, a really sort of complex uh, and, and in-depth uh, diegetic history of this place and, and how it came to be. Um, and they really thought through the ways that histories of place and power um, shape the, the present realities of place and, and the ways we feel about places. Um, but it actually took them a lot of kind of negotiating and collaborating and working to, to get to that, that point because they kind of started with this sort of initial idea um, that was rooted in uh, inspiration from, from popular culture, actually from Star Wars of, of a place that had a light side and a dark side. And so they developed this idea of a place that was very prosperous and developed and built up on one side of this river, whereas the other bank of the river was this sort of wasteland with, with nothing growing on it, where everything is sort of a, an inky, oily black, um, and, and there's not much happening. But uh, through uh, their discussions around the, the prompts that were part of the camp, right, particularly the prompt around thinking about the history of a place, um, that forced them to kind of complicate this essentialist idea of like, you know, there's good parts of town and there's bad parts of town that kind of erase class and, and colonial histories that, that result in, in parts of town being different, right? Um, in, in my discussions with the group, I, I kind of pointedly asked them, you know, well, what, what, what makes a place like this? What, what, what makes a place have two areas that are right next to each other where one is thriving and one is, is struggling so much? Um, and they actually, in response, um, in elaborating kind of the, the history of this place, um, drew upon another pop culture reference, um, which was the, the Hunger Games books and movies, where there's um, a more acute um, articulation, right, of um, an upper class uh, that is preying upon a lower class, that's extracting materials from land, that's extracting human lives from land and from lower classes. Um, and they started developing out this narrative, or maybe this side of the river was decimating the land on the other side of the river. Um, it actually led to a point of tension in the group because there were some students that um, were clearly made uncomfortable by the idea that there might be a human hand in this kind of inequality, in this kind of inequity. Um, and, and one of the ways that manifested was another shift in their narrative where um, some students um, suggested that perhaps this inequity was the result of a natural disaster that this river that's dividing the two sides of the, of the town um, had flooded uh, and perhaps decimated this one side. Um, but then students who were invested in this idea of um, potentially exploitation between the two sides um, sort of integrated the natural disaster narrative into, into this class conscious narrative. Um, by kind of bringing in the idea of climate refugees from the real world, um, the idea that there are right uh, colonial powerful places um, that are less affected by climate change, 
uh, and there are formerly colonized or still colonized places, um, largely places in the global south that disproportionately are affected by climate change, right? And in the real world, there are climate refugees from these affected places who are seeking shelter in um, less affected former colonial um, locations, right? Uh, and so they developed this story where perhaps the, the, the decimated side of the river was once a thriving uh, metropole as well, um, but due to this natural disaster, the flooding of the river, um, that side was decimated and people from that side came to the more prosperous side, the untouched side to seek refuge. They, they came as refugees, um, but the more prosperous side um, was um, restrained in their ability or, or their wish uh, to host the refugees uh, and instituted a quota. And there's a, a refugee enclave or community on this side where some people were able to safely come across the river, but many were turned away. And the last kind of wrinkle of this narrative they developed was that the, the side that was sort of decimated was also now haunted by the spirits of people that had been uh, that had sought refuge and been refused refuge by the denizens of the more affluent side of, of the place. So they, in the course of developing this place that now has this really complex history behind it that's navigating sort of um, histories of power uh, and place and connecting to real life colonial histories of power and place, the students also had to navigate and negotiate between each other uh, around their own kind of feelings of comfort or discomfort around um, colonial histories, um, human culpability in those histories, perhaps their own culpability in colonial histories based on their positionality. Um, and so they had these really interesting kind of meaty discussions in developing this place um, in response to the prompts that we were kind of uh, putting in front of them. And then in terms of those meaty discussions, one of the big things that we observed as the, as the groups were, putting their various aspects together um, in order to develop such a complex narrative, they had to also talk to each other. <laughs> um, and what that ended up doing was, uh, whereas in a lot of the other groups, it was very clear where the sections of, this is where my area is and where your area begins. Uh, this group has assets that were created by other team members. Uh, to be used in other parts of the various areas. There aren't even necessarily clear quadrants. Um, there are certainly zones and areas that the different students were focusing on, but like one student was really focusing on making trees that are scattered throughout um, and the various gems. And so what was really interesting was that uh, by taking on these really deep, intense discussions um, and really grappling with some of the questions and prompts that Luke was presenting them with, they also developed community like they were really focused on on building rapport and you could tell by the way that the group was interacting with each other um you know it was beyond just having a good time they were making really genuine connections about you know who they were in relation to one another um and i think when different students brought up different points uh they were seeing their their peers in different ways um and and overall i just i was really blown away um, at the depth with which the students approach the material. And even when I think it became tense or uncomfortable, um, they, were, they were still able to be present to that. Um, and in doing so, um, made, made place together um, to, to, hold, to, hold, uh, to hold those discussions together, so. And that's what we have to share with you all today. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, if you wanna check out or use the resource that we developed for creating digital places with students, um, the link is there on the screen. Uh, and if you wanna reach out to us, um, if you're um, watching this during the, the sort of live broadcast uh, during the NAEA conference, we're, we're in the chat right now, you can chat with us. Um, or if you're watching this uh, pre-recorded presentation at another time, feel free to reach out to us at um, either of those emails on the screen. Uh, but again, thanks so much for for your time. Uh, bye everyone.